Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar from the School of Taste. I am Nick Jackson, the Master of Wine. Now, this is the first webinar in what I hope will be a series of webinars, which will discuss people's careers in the wine business. My thinking is that uh, this is a time in 2020 when people are assessing and reassessing many parts of their lives, including their careers. So I thought it might be fun to talk with people who work in the business to get an insight into what their careers have been like and what insights they have to share. So perhaps if you're thinking about working in the wine business, starting a career, or perhaps you already work in the wine business, but you're looking for some kind of ideas about maybe moving to a different part of the business. That's what I hope we can uh, explore a little bit by having conversations with very, uh, what I hope are and believe are very interesting people. The first of whom is my longstanding friend, Vanessa Price. Uh, I've known Vanessa for many years since we were working together in the New York wine business. Um, Vanessa is a wine educator, a wine author, uh, a wine artist, and a general all-round wine expert. So um, I think she will have a lot to share with us. Um, Vanessa, thank you very much for being my willing victim for the first one of these. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us here today. Oh, I love being a guinea pig. Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay, so um, what I think we should start with is the natural place in these things, which is the beginning. Um, Vanessa has kindly supplied me with these uh, slides of some of her experiences of her career. So this first one illustrates, I guess, the beginnings of your uh, wine career, uh, Vanessa. Maybe you can explain uh, a little bit about your background, where you grew up, and what, if any, contact you had with wine as you were growing up. Sure. Um, so I'm originally from Louisville, Kentucky. For those of you who might not know where that is, that's Louisville to the rest of the world. Um, I was raised in a Southern Baptist teetotaling family. So there was not only any wine around, there was no alcohol of any kind. Um, I actually didn't even see my dad take a sip of beer until after my 21st birthday. So um, alcohol was certainly something that I did not grow up with. Um, I got started in the wine business by total accident. When I um, first graduated from high school, um, I got a, a fire lit under my, my patush to move to New York because I thought I was gonna be this big glamorous actress and uh, do all these things. And I went to conservatory for theater at a place called the American Musical and Dramatic Academy. And uh, they were a wonderful couple of years. But when I graduated and I started doing the audition circuit in New York City and realized how utterly brutal it was, I sort of thought, well, if the entertainment thing doesn't work out, maybe I should have a college degree to fall back on. Um, so I agreed to move home to Kentucky for that whole in-state tuition thing. And um, because I wanted to go back to New York City as soon as humanly possible, I just decided to fast track my college career. So I actually did university in two years, um, which I know is pretty crazy, but um, I have a iron will uh, if you get to know me. Um, and so wine was just sort of a happy accident that happened because um, with a rigorous schedule like that, I really didn't have much time to work. So I was looking for a job that would, you know, give me a little bit of like, you know, free play money because, you know, I was a young adult. I wanted a little bit of independence, um, but finding something that would only accept you for a shift or two a week was difficult until someone told me about a winery in downtown Louisville, Kentucky that was only open to the public on Friday and Saturday nights. So they only had two shifts to offer, which was perfect for me. Um, if you if you're actually looking at the slide, you can see the gentleman in the um, for me the upper left hand corner with the Christmas tree. That's Dave. Um, he was my first wine boss, which I'm sure would make him. <laughs> Um, he, I remember when I went in for the interview, he was like, so tell me what you know about wine. And I was like, I don't know anything. And he was like, are you available on Friday and Saturday nights? And I said, yes. And he said, you're hired. <laughs> and so um, that was where it started. Um, you can see those are some of my colleagues in the, uh, the upper right hand corner and then just some pictures of the facilities down below. Um, so yeah, I get asked the question a lot. They make wine in Kentucky. And the answer is yes, from Kentucky grapes. Um, it's the Ohio River Valley AVA, which which actually covers four states, which is insane. Um, right. That was how I got my start in wine was a happy college job accident. So when I finished 
college, when I went to my family and said, all right, I'm going back to New York, they said, okay, so you're going back to be the big famous actress now. And I said, no, I'm going back to be a sommelier. And they were like, <laughs> what is that? This is crazy. We just wrapped our head around the acting thing. So um, it definitely took some, some doing in the beginning, sort of convincing myself that I could have an opportunity in the world of wine since it was something that I hadn't grown up with or really had any exposure to. Um, I just knew that it intrigued me and I wanted to see what I could do in it. Fantastic. Okay, so you did, uh, in fact, move back to New York after your brief stint at college. And I, uh, I love this rather chaotic uh, series of images here illustrating your <laughs> move back. Uh, what was it about New York, by the way, that uh, made it irresistible to you? Um, you know, I think I, I'm going to say that I'm a cliche in that sense. I, um, you know, I was bright eyed and bushy tailed. And, you know, I still remember the first time that I saw Times Square and just being like, this is the life and the glamour. And, you know, I had no idea that every right. New Yorker hates Times Square. And um, <laughs> I don't know. I just I, I you know, I'm, I'm I mean, you know me well. I'm, I'm fed by energy. I'm fed by excitement. I'm, I'm fed by new. You know, I love learning. I love you know exposing myself to new things um and so new york just seemed like a place that i could do that you know and in the beginning i definitely thought that when i moved there it was going to be all glitz and glamour uh which is probably why <laughs> i took these images for what it's really like when you move to new york right. um you use your wine rack as your um place to dry your undies <laughs> <laughs> there's no else to do it um the upper right hand corner is actually when i got bed bugs which was a horrible oh, horrible horrible time in life um but that is an, an, an essential new york experience to have bed bugs yeah it's 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 um awful to say but it's definitely something that it's like once you join the club and you feel comfortable talking about it you find out that so right. many other people experienced it as well and you're like oh i'm not alone <laughs> Um, yeah. But yeah, definitely got the bed bugs. And then um, you can see my wonderful dog that I had for 13 years, Munchies, who um, put up with me literally using her as like part desk. <laughs> <laughs> the apartment was so tiny and cramped and I just needed somewhere to work. So um, yeah. I also, I also love the, uh, the hot sauce there on the, uh, on, the, on the table by the bed. Oh yeah, there's two things that I you can always count on me having. It's uh, wine and hot sauce. Like I never identified with the line in a song more than when Beyonce said, I got hot sauce in my bag, swag. I was like, ah, I'm not the only one. I'm one of those people that freaks out if you get food anywhere near the bed. So this is just totally alien territory for me. <laughs> well, I okay, think so you were, okay. What's that? What was your first job though? What was your first job in the wine business in New York? And did you, how did you get it? Did you just walk into it when you showed back up in the city? What was your experience of trying to even find that job? So um, that job was actually related to the wine that I would say that I was drinking at that time. Um, I moved back to the city. I had no clue what I was doing. I had no clue. I didn't even know what like formal education wine classes were. I did, you know, I knew nothing. I just knew that I wanted to find a job and I wanted to find it doing something in wine. And up to that point, all of my experiences had been in hospitality. And where I'd found an apartment was way up on the Upper East Side. Um, so, I, you know, I wanted to find something close to where I was. And so I just started looking on Craigslist. Um, I have to say several times throughout my life, which is also very quintessential New York, Craigslist has saved right. me like it has brought me so many joys in this life um if they ever did advertisement i would sign up for it but um i found a woman named delona who was opening a wine bar on the upper east side of manhattan she was older she was retired she had been a very successful photographer throughout her life traveling the world to exotic places and um in her retirement had um decided to lease a tiny little space on the Upper East Side where she was gonna put together a pretty serious wine program, um, have it be pretty much exclusively like all wine and charcuterie, stuff like that. But she sort of designed it to be this little like Mediterranean oasis with the pretty oh, backyard. Nice. Um, but she didn't know anything about, about hospitality. Um, and I knew mm -hmm. very little about wine. I just knew that I wanted to know more. Um, and Alona had spent much of her time traveling through um, France, Spain, and Northern Africa. And so a lot of the wines that she gravitated towards were from the Languedoc in southwestern France. And one of her favorites was Bouzet. 
So it's an interesting appellation, like at the beginning of your wine journey to be introduced to, right, to be so niche. But um, that was towards the beginning of mine because she loved Bouzet so much. Um, I remember, you know, I called it Bouzette and she went, you know, she sort of bristled and, you know, tried to correct me, remembering it was the girl from Kentucky. And um, she, she just sort of took me under her wing in the sense of teaching me what she knew about wine, which was, you know, not formally trained, but certainly a lifetime of experiences. Um, yeah. And I did my best to, you know, hold up the hospitality side. It was literally just the two of us. I would run the upstairs and she would man the kitchen doing all of the charcuterie plates and everything. And um, I remember in the beginning, my first night I walked out with uh, for a, I think it was like a 10 hour shift. I walked out with 20 bucks in my pocket. Um, by the time, by the time we really got going, I could leave there with a couple grand in my pocket on a Saturday night. We were rocking. I could have, um, I think the, the capacity on the place was 80 people and we probably packed it a little bit more full than that. Uh, and it was just me. <laughs> so I had to learn to talk about, cause we had 40 different wines by the glass. So I had to learn to talk about a lot of different wines um, really, really quickly, right? Because you get the questions and when you have that many wines by the glass. So um, it was a great first exposure point because it forced me to start to learn a lot really fast. Yeah, I always think that right at the beginning of people's wine careers, they can do three jobs which are super useful, which are really just diving into the deep end and give them so much experience. One is to effectively be a sommelier, you know, whatever you want to call it, a server, just be on the floor having to interact with the public, getting the responses, being able to make quick decisions and helping people. The mm -hmm. second would be working on the floor of a retail store. Everyone yeah. who's worked on the floor of a retail store in the run up to the holidays has learned a lot both about wine and about people especially and how to serve them. Um, and the third one I think, which is really, really interesting is to work for a distributor, um, a wholesaler distributor, um, which is also part of your story as well. Yep. Yeah. Um, so why don't we talk about that now? So you, at some point you left the wine bar and you moved over to um, an important uh, distributor in New York State called Empire. How did that happen? So I actually had a few um, jobs in between. Um, I, I actually had the the very bad uh, judgment to decide to leave the wine bar, not because I, I didn't love Alona, but because um, I knew that if I didn't leave at some point, being on the service side, on the hospitality side, I probably never would. Um, and yeah. so, you know, I just wanted to see what was out there, but I, I was brilliant enough to time it with the the financial crash. <laughs> Uh, so all the free work that, freelance work that I had been doing, um, I was doing some stuff for a PR firm and different things. It all sort of dried up because, you know, freelance work is always the first thing to go when there's a financial downturn. Um, and um, I did a brief stint um, doing some education stuff, which is is talked about a little bit in the book, um, which which wasn't the, the most fun experience. But the great thing about it was um, upon leaving there, um, someone that I had met along the way reached out to me and said, um, hey, have you ever thought about sales? And I said, no way, absolutely not. I would never be in sales for whatever. I didn't know anything about sales. I just, to me, it just sounded like something I wanted nothing to do with. And I remember she was a woman that I looked up to very, very much. Um, and she said uh, she manages um, one of the most prestigious uh, Napa estates. Um, and uh, she said, do me a favor, take a meeting. And I took the meeting and I remember thinking like, no way, like their offices were way out in the middle of like industrial Queens and, you know, everybody was like Long Island, Brooklyn, Queens sort of thing. And I was like, I'm never going to fit in here. I don't know anything about sales. This world seems so foreign to me. And then um, the guy that would be my boss, um, I went in to meet him and he turned out to be a Georgia boy. <laughs> <laughs> like the one other southerner in the whole company and um you know he sort of laughed and said um you know i can understand how you might feel like you know you're on the outside of something but certainly you know if you come here we'll make sure that you feel like you're a part of our community and our family and uh he convinced me to join and i'm so glad that i did which is interesting isn't it because um, the reputation of this company empire within the wine business in new york is not very high people you know call it things like the evil empire and things like this and um the reason i guess that people are a bit skeptical about it is that they think that it's more of a numbers game right about um, depletion reports and sales numbers rather than really caring about about wine in a serious way did you 
know about that reputation before you walked in there and what, what was your mind changed about it when you did work there? Um, I knew that everyone said big was bad and everyone said small was good, um, but I, I'm not going to name names on this one because it's it's not about that, but just as a comparative point, um, I actually got offered two sales jobs, uh, one with another wholesaler, which was a much smaller, more beloved one, and I actually said yes to that one first. And I went to my very my very first day with them because um, I'd been offered both jobs. I hadn't yet declined Empire. I was kind of like playing like both both sides, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And my very first day was a sales meeting where they bring all the sales reps into the office, and you know they say like, "Hey, these are the new wines, the new vintages, whatever," and you talk about it so that you know the product that you're going out to sell in the marketplace. And um, I remember the the leader of this particular. Um, distributor he he stood up and he said some things that just didn't really sit right with me in terms of like uh how he had secured such low costs on these wines and it just seemed like he had taken a little bit of advantage of, of some desperate farmers and um the whole interaction just didn't really sit well with me and so even though i kind of knew that empire had this reputation i felt like I had had a warmer and more genuine experience there, at least from the start. And so I thought, I, you know, people say big is bad, but I'm going to give it a go. Um, I don't think I realized how much people I hated Empire until I actually went out to start selling wine and realized that people were like, get out of here before they even um, heard what I had to say or, you know, tasted what I what I had to sell. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge to overcome. But um you know, it's interesting. I think that part of the reason they get the reputation is they are big, right? And and big is frustrating. I, I've I've certainly felt that myself. I'm not going to say that you know it's it's a company with, with no faults. There's no such thing on earth. Um, but beyond that, you know, sort of classic axiom. It's it's still a family, and the people that I worked for in the divisions that I worked for they cared about wine, you know? And so that was what mattered to me was the people that I worked for cared about what I was doing. And they were the first to um, really support me in formalizing my education, um, supporting me in going through, starting with the W um, SET program and and getting going in there. Um, you know, they invested in me. And, and not only that, um, I, I ended up winning um, sales rep of the year there. Wow. And um, I remember thinking, well, shit, I'm like, late 20s and I you know I guess I peaked in this position now what do I do and um you know that can't be the be that can't be the pinnacle of my career I'm too young right. and um I went to my boss and said the big boss at, at at the company and I said um I need to grow I need to to move up and do other things and uh you know he said all right um you know why are you telling me this and i said well before i just quit because you all have done so much good for me i figured i would tell you before i just look elsewhere and he said that's fair give me a year and um he actually found, helped me find my next job with another company right so like that that to me is is the ultimate sign of of a good leader and a good boss is to know that um, to recognize my value, to support it, and then to see when it was time for me to continue growing and support me on that that path, you know. So um, I know from the outside, the the high delivery minimums and the frustration with the lack of communication, and you know, there's those litany of things which you experienced as a buyer. Um, it doesn't, you know, completely take away from the human side of the company because there is a very human side to them. Yeah, and just to fill in the gaps for anyone who's watching from other countries, and I don't know how the kind of the setup of the industry works in New York or in the US, uh, wholesalers are very powerful in uh, the US, especially those who import wine, um, because usually in the country, or at least in the state you're in, there's only one importer or wholesaler which will have that wine. And so if you're a restaurant or you're a retail store, you want to buy that wine, you have to go to that person. And now your job, Vanessa, was to be the go-between between between the restaurant and the retailer and the uh, the wholesaler. And so you would try and sell the product and take the orders. Now, yeah. were you on commission only or were you also salaried? I was 100% commission. I mean, that is a scary thing to be at any point in anyone's career. Where did you come down on that in the end? Did you hate it to begin with? Did you like it from the start? Did you hate it at the end? 
I hated it at the beginning because it was terrifying. Um, I was very fortunate to be put on. So, you know, within each division, because it's such a large distributor, there are many, many, many divisions. And within those divisions, there are teams, right? It's like, you know, you go further and further down the hierarchical chart. Um, and I was very fortunate to be on a team of very strong sales reps. And, you know, they taught me a lot. And so very quickly, I sort of developed that muscle that was like, commission is good because, you know, you eat what you kill. Yeah. And, um, you know, if I was smart about it, if I was, if I was, um, a go-getter, if I, if I was self-motivated, um, that only meant good things. Um, I, I, I mean, from when I was hired to, to when I left to go to my next job, um, I more than tripled my salary. So, uh, it was actually hard to walk away from, <laughs> sure. I had to take a pay cut to go to the next job, but I was the same thing. It was like, you know, I can stay and I can keep making this great money and this can be the end of my journey or I can take a risk and take a pay cut and grow. And I ultimately decided that the growth was an investment of a different kind. Um, yeah. But in terms of the, what's up? Sorry, carry on, carry on. Oh no, please, please. No, I, but you, I see, I had, when I was a buyer in New York City, so I'd work with people like, with people like you and that's how we first got to know each other. But um, I would have some sales reps who would have done the same job for 30, 40 years selling the same product because right. if they had the right accounts, i.e. a restaurant or a retail store, there's only one rep for each restaurant or retail store. You have some huge restaurant or retail store, you can be earning $100,000 in commission just from that one place. And mm -hmm. how, many, how many different uh, accounts did you have? My run started, so a run is your is your territory or the list of accounts that you call on. Um, it started pretty big because each account was only worth, you know, pittance, if anything at all. Some of them weren't worth anything. There was about 180 accounts. Uh, by the time I left, that list had whittled down to about 90, so about half that, because mm -hmm. those accounts were then generating enough revenue that I could, you know, cut the number of people I was servicing. Sure. Sure. But the point is, there can be a lot of money if you love doing sales and if you're a good people person, I believe. Do you, you can, think that that's an essential skill? Money. <laughs> What's Perfect. that? Being a people person, though. I mean, how much of a, of a factor that is? I mean, I think we can all see just listening to you that you're, you're, you're outgoing, you're easy to talk to. But I mean, was that an essential part of being able to sell wine? Or do you think that you could be quiet and diffident and awkward, naming no names and still do the job? I think that there are many personalities that succeed at wine. Um, to give you sort of a brief example, I remember, um, so when I first started and I had no clue what I was doing, um, my boss, my direct boss, Frank, um, who was great, he was a football coach, right? So he had that sort of mentality already. Um, he said, your first two days, I'm gonna send you out with two different sales reps on our team, the two strongest sales reps. He said, and he, that was all he told me. He said, you're going to follow along with both of them each day and you're going to see what they do. And one of them was a very boisterous Israeli, very outgoing, you know, always using his hands for everything. And, you know, the world was ending every day. And, you know, he had a very aggressive style and people loved him, right? He said crazy things all the time. You didn't know what he was going to come out of his mouth next. And, you know, accounts just ate him up and lapped him up. And I thought, all right, well, that's have to be, I have to be very gregarious. I have to be very outgoing. I have to be very, you know, this is how I have to be. And then the next day they sent me out with a guy um, who's, who's, who's uh, an Irish guy from, from New Jersey, very quiet, very reserved, doesn't have a lot to say, very organized, and I remember, um, you know, the first account we went to, it's a very iconic steakhouse in Midtown called Sparks, uh, which has a very iconic wine list. And I remember, you know, it was this very like we sat down, he got out his pad and his paper and he started calling out, you know, to the buyer, all of these things that he knew they had bought X amount of in X amount of time. And given their, you know, typical run rates in terms of how much they sell, uh, this is what they're probably doing up on. And this is the current pricing for that. And it was just so organized and like, boom, 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 straight down the row. And it was very clear that he had done all of his homework beforehand. And it was a very quiet, very subdued meeting. There wasn't a lot of joking and back and forth, but we walked out of there with an order that blew my mind in terms of the size of it. And so I think the point that Frank was trying to make to me was, there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. You just have to figure out what is the best path for you, right? I think that's so important because I, I the thing I get over and over again, talking to people at the beginning of their wine careers is, 
in really to sum up what they're saying is i am afraid of sales and it's like you terrifying. were saying oh it's so terrifying but, i'm not going to say it's not it's so <laughs> terrifying <laughs> but the point is a lot of people think they're handicapped by their personality right that they're just the type of person they are they can't succeed but i was on the other end of the i was on the receiving end right of what of what reps like you were offering and sometimes the most popular people would come in, but I wouldn't enjoy the time with them because they wouldn't be organized or they wouldn't know the facts about the wine or they wouldn't know what was in stock or something. I much preferred working with, they could have been an alien from Mars as long as they could tell me what the price was and when I could get the item. I just right. needed to be organized, you know? No yeah. one in New York has got any time, right? So you just tell me what I need and give it to me. <laughs> Well, I, I, you know, I, I think that what you just touched on is if I was going to give a piece of advice to anyone that wanted to get into sales, um, it's the most important thing, in my opinion, is to know your buyers, right? Because so like you as a buyer, you wanted inventory pricing availability. Please mm -hmm. give it to me in a succinct way that is accurate and timely, whereas other buyers they are gonna. They knew what they were gonna buy from you the moment you walked in the door. But what they wanted was for you to sit down and have a coffee and have a conversation and hear about their kids and what was going on in the world. And you know, like every buyer had a different drive or a pin code. I remember someone told me once, everyone has a pin code. You just have to figure out, you know, what right. their pin code is. And so, I think in terms of having, you know, the advice that I would give to any new sales rep would be understand the people that you're talking to, right? They gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. So listen to what your buyers want from you and give them that. It's not rocket science, you know? Um, so what one buyer want may be different from another and that has nothing to do with your personality. You know, you may click better with some than others, but certainly any personality could do the job. That's fantastic to hear. And so uh, you mentioned in your previous job, you were drinking kind of humble French country wines but now we've kind of upgraded at least in price terms to some higher higher ticket items here but um yeah so uh empire they sold a lot of um a lot of branded wine but they also sold a lot of very premium uh, expensive fine wine from europe uh, and uh, the kind of names that you're mentioning here Oberswan, gaia from piedmont um, but you really stuck with the kind of fine wine end when you did make that transition to your next job Yes. Oh, so the one thing I wanted to say, um, so in terms of the pictures on this, like these were the kind of things that was like a sales rep's life. It really was the glamour of like the nice dinners and going to see wineries or, or going to see uh, vineyards that was in Alsace. Uh, but it was also things like hauling cases and spilling wine and all of the chaos that comes with that. And then those chocolates I put in there, that was something that I did um, every Christmas for my buyers. I made over 500 chocolates and distributed them. Um, it was crazy, but those are the things you did for your buyers. Um, so yeah, it was definitely an upgrade in terms of like experience and what I, you know, it was my first exposure to culture, I guess we'll say, hence right. the, the names like Opus and Gaia. Yeah, and what a lot of people won't realize, the life of a sales rep in New York is maybe the hardest place to be a sales rep in America, physically speaking, maybe very lucrative, but in, in most markets, what you do if you're a sales rep is you load your wine that you're gonna taste with the accounts into your car, and then you just drive around and park and taste. In New York, you can't drive, so you have to haul your bag of wine, usually with 12 bottles of wine in it, in your chiller bag, put it on the subway, haul it up the steps, whether it's in the freezing depth of winter or in the sweltering summer, and it's it can be a brutal job. And you have to look nice. <laughs> you can't be in like workout clothes doing it, so it's like crazy, but you know, you fake it. <laughs> fake it till you make it. That is New York City. Okay, so then you moved to from Empire to this company, which is called MMD. Everyone in the business in um, around the world knows it as MMD, but it stands for Maison, Marc, and Domain. Um, tell us a little bit about that company and what you your job was there. Oh, Maison, Marc, and Domain. So that is the um, import company that is owned by Champagne Louis Roder, uh, the house that makes Cristal, which is pro probably what they're most famous for outside of the industry. Um, they, the family, it's still family owned and operated. There's no corporate entity, no board of directors. It's one family, seventh generation. 
Um, they actually own a number of wineries around the world, including Dominat in Provence, Delos in the Rhone, Ramos Pinto in Portugal, a number of properties in California, such as Diamond Creek, Mary Edwards, uh, Rotor Estate, um, a number of significant properties. Um, and they also have some longstanding relationships with uh, prestigious families from other areas of the world, like Bordeaux with the Jean-Pierre Moix establishment and uh, Pio Cesare in Piedmont and uh, a number of other wineries. Um, so very, very, very special people to work for. And were you also doing sales there? So the job started as sales when I first, so I was with them for six years and, and, um, certainly in the beginning it was, it was a straight sales job. I was basically doing the same thing I've been doing for empire, except now I was, instead of having, you know, a hundred accounts and, uh, mm -hmm. a whole book to sell, right. Because empire's book of wines was so big. Now I had an entire market and a much smaller, you know, more focused right. book of just my, my, uh, my wines from the, the MMD. And my job was to work with the sales reps at the company I had previously been with in terms of going out into the marketplace and, um, representing my wines. Um, it eventually morphed into more for that. I took on, marketing responsibilities, event responsibilities, education responsibilities, um, because they're a wonderful company that allowed me to grow as well. Um, but sales was always the core part of the job, just a more macro view of a market instead of a micro view. So at this point, you've clearly transitioned into working what we generally refer to as fine wine, wine that you can resell on the secondary market if you're minded to do that. We're talking about Cristal and you know, Petrus and the, the, some of the top estates from Bordeaux and California. Um, was it a conscious decision for you to go and work in that end of the market or did it just kind of happen? Uh, you mean going to MMD? Going to work in really the fine wine end of the market as opposed to selling, you know, 10, $15 bottles. Oh, it was 100% a conscious decision. As I mentioned previously, that conversation that I had with um, the, a gentleman named David, who who is um, one of the owners of, of the company, you know, I had said, I, I need to grow, I need to do, I need to, you know, there's there's things that I want to accomplish. And, um, you know, he had actually brought me several opportunities along the way and said, what about this? What about this? And obviously, like, they all had some incentive that tied back, you know, they were companies that were somehow aligned with his um, and I had said that they didn't interest me because um, they weren't moving in a direction that appealed to me, which was this fine wine world that I really wanted to grasp and understand more. And um, when Maison Marc and Domain, when the opportunity to work for them came along, I nearly fell over backwards. <laughs> um, it took that was, almost that was an easy decision. Yeah, wow. yeah. It was, uh, it was a long time to get the job, but um, I did it. So I was really proud of myself for that. And I was honored to get to work for the family. Now, when I knew you at that time, I think something important happens at that point of your career, which was that at some point you started having a bit more creative freedom uh, in the way that you were working. Yes. Um, how, did, how did that happen and what did that mean to you? Well, it happened because um, when you're a sales rep, you're working on 100% commission. And every 30 days, the clock starts over, right? It doesn't matter if you work for a little guy or a big guy, you always have monthly goals, right? So like, these are sure. the wines that we're going after. Uh, these are the quantities that we need to sell, go do. And then the next month, the clock goes back to zero or the count goes back to zero and you start all over again. Um, whereas with working for an importer, you have the entire, you just, you have your wineries that you work with and you have the goals for the year and you have to work all year to make those goals. So when you're looking at a 12 month plan instead of a 30 day plan, you have more flexibility in terms of like, okay, well, how, how am I gonna get from A to Z, right? And right. so it allowed me, and on top of that, I was fortunate enough to work for people that were open to new ideas. They wanted fresh blood. They wanted new ways of doing, th doing things. And so they allowed me to experiment with how I went to market, how I, you know, contacted or dealt with or entertained buyers, um, which allowed me to sort of spread my wings a little bit and uh, figure out what worked and what didn't work. But certainly it was a function of flexibility on expectations and um, working for people that wanted to see that sort of like creativity. That's really nice. It's nice to be in the kind of job that enables you to do those things which come, it sounds like quite naturally to you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> if I say so, and I do say so. 
Um, now, was this? Now, I believe this was also the time when you started uh, teaching WSET. Was that? Was that? Is that correct? Um. Well, so I I started. I did level three when I was with Empire. I started level four diploma when I was with Empire. I finished it when I was with MMD, and then I started teaching level one and two, maybe like a year after that. Right. And so, yeah. what did? I mean, you had. I already. I know that you already had a pretty busy uh, time at work, and you were doing other stuff. Why did you want to get into uh, teaching? What did it? What did it give you? So I remember the first time I sat in a wine class, it wasn't a WSET wine class. It was like one of the first, like, you know, regional, you go pay, you know, for a 10 class thing and you don't really understand what the certification you're getting is, but you're just like, I'll be a SOM when it's done. Um, I remember the first class, you know, we had the wines lined up in front of us and, you know, the instructor is talking and he, you know, he picks up his glass and he's like, you know, notes of lemon, lime, citrus, you know, a, a you know, a, <laughs> you know a salt rind background and i don't even remember what i was saying you know in a bright core with the you know a linear verve and a strong finish and you know i'm tasting <laughs> it I'm like it just tastes like white wine i don't know what is he talking about um and i remember thinking like okay 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 well it's just the first class like i'll get it you know by the 10th class because like a 10 week series i said by the 10th 10th class i'm gonna know what he's talking about and i remember at the 10th class like i smelled the wine and it still just smelled like white wine to me like i couldn't yeah. parse these nuances and i remember being frustrated with myself about that for a long time even though you know that wasn't even like some big high level certification thing um and eventually i remember having a conversation with my dad about it because he's actually an extraordinary speaker um he's spoken to much more important people than me um and i remember he said well sweetheart i don't think it's that you can't get it i think it's that you don't have context right so to learn anything to absorb anything you know it's like you think about university you take your 101s and then your 102s and your 103s and your 201s 202s because you're, you're you're building that foundation up and 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 one of the challenges i think with with wine is that a lot of times instructors can assume that there is a base level of knowledge that may right. or may not be there and so it becomes difficult to be on the same wavelength and so you know call it a you know a crusade of mission or whatever I just sort of felt like if I was going to teach I was going to try and teach trying to provide context and and to maybe do things in a way that I thought would have been more helpful for me <laughs> when I was a student um and so that's that's what I started trying to do on top of which like it's just an extreme honor to be able to teach for the wine and spirit education trust like to be able to say that that I teach for them is is a privilege so um certainly can't negate that at all so before we move on from this slide, you, you'll have to explain to us in a sec why you're looking so sad uh, in the photo <laughs> in the elevator. But I also yeah. just uh, mentioned that the, the wine, you know, Louis Redder, you, you already mentioned. But um, I mean, when I'm at the end of your time at MMD, you were sort of Miss Louis Redder in New York City and in Long Island, which is an unbelievable market for uh, champagne and other fine wines because of the Hamptons. And people would see you and they'd be like, oh, there's the Louis Roderick girl. Or the uh, other family, very important family property, as you mentioned in that in that portfolio, is Domain Ott uh, in yeah. the summer. And selling Domain Ott in the Hamptons in the summer, I mean, really, there can't be much a better market for any particular wine anywhere on earth than right there. I mean, that must have been a lot of fun. Oh, that was so much fun. I mean, it was that was an entree into a world that, like, I mean, you know, all the movies and the shows and the the, the books right. that you read, it's all true. <laughs> it's not fabricated. It's just a world that like, I remember thinking like, how did this Kentucky girl end up here? Um, and to represent a wine that is not only, you know, not only does it have the name, it also has the serious reputation in terms of being a serious producer who is mindful right. about their being mindful about the quality that they produce um and on top of that being just like epically cool good people um there couldn't have been like a more cool position you know people wanting to talk to you because you were the ot girl and you know they needed to make sure they got their allocation so um that was certainly really cool 
And what, what is happening in this last picture on this slide? Oh, right. Okay. So uh, continuation of before, there's always wine breaking whenever you're a wine <laughs> sales. And just whenever you're in sales, import, writing, whatever, I don't know. There's always wine breaking, maybe because I'm always moving too fast. Um, that was one of my bosses at MMD, Sergio, who um, he's making that thing look light, but that's actually a, a, a 15 liter that we had engraved for a client, which was pretty cool. Cool. Uh, and and then the uh, the slide above that's a dinner that we had at Pio Cesare actually so um, you know getting to taste old vintage Barolo and and Barbaresco with you know the proprietor in their winery it's just like how do these things you know get up to itself um, and then this last one I included just because it was like such a sort of defining time um, I actually had to have um, hip surgery from um, my doctors think it was a combination of I'm kind of an avid worker outer. I do a lot of running and yoga and weightlifting and all that surfing, um, all that stuff. But um, also from all the years of hauling wine, they think I kind of jacked myself up being um, a small, <laughs> small gal hauling a lot of heavy weight. And so I ended up having to have um, hip surgery, which um, wasn't a whole boat of fun. But um, again, you know, even though I was out of commission for a couple of months, I'll be eternally grateful that I worked for a company that supported me needing to take that time and um, making sure that everything was taken care of for me. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of glamour to the business, but there's also a lot of not glamour to the business. So, you know, just sort of balancing those, the perspective of those two sides. Okay, now, Around about this time, you also, um, I believe, I'm not sure exactly what the timeline is, but at some point right. you also started writing uh, a bit more. And yeah. um, that started, I believe, if I'm correct, with the column in the magazine. Is that correct? Um, that, so they actually coincided when I was working with MMD, uh, which is another reason that I just have all the respect in the world for them. Because when I got the opportunity to write for New York Magazine, one of the first things they told me was, you can't write about any MMD wine. That would be a conflict of interest. So you need to make sure that your employers are okay with you writing about sure. wine that are never the wines that you represent in the marketplace. And so taking that back to my bosses and saying, hey. <laughs> and they said, you know what? If you do it on your own time and you know you're not it's not something that's interfering with company business and um you know you you we know that you want to grow and you're always pushing and sure. um you know so yeah go and do it just you know be respectful in terms of managing your time with what you need to do for us with that um which is extraordinary i can't say that a lot of companies would would have been forgiving of that um and i'll probably be eternally grateful to them for that because it changed my life um I had the opportunity to write a one-off piece, which kind of went along the same lines of the thinking as the thinking of um, the teaching that I was talking about. So for me, and one of the things that like I always sort of, sort of harp on is context, 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 context. Like you can't give someone concept, co uh, concepts if they don't have an anchor, right? They've got to have sure. something that they anchor to it for them. So um, the idea behind this piece that I pitched was the idea of taking a silly everyday food uh, and pairing it with a real wine, not like, you know, whatever wine the latest company slapped a label on, but like a real wine from a real winery with, you know, that, that was, you know, serious about their farming and, uh, you know, you know, the, the product that they were putting in the marketplace. And that was a wine that was maybe a little bit misunderstood. Um, and so I, I wrote a one-off piece that was about pairing Sour Patch Kids with uh, semi-dry Riesling from the Finger Lakes Riesling, uh, region. And um, New York Magazine put it up and lo and behold, it went like viral. <laughs> and I think it's because people just thought it was hilarious that they were like, yeah, you're going to pair this like serious wine with this silly food, but the hope was that maybe they walked away understanding that sweet doesn't mean cheap, right? Not all Rieslings are stylistically the same. The seriousness of what can be produced in upstate New York, right? There was a number of takeaways, but they were all sort of framed around the context in this sense being this sour candy that we, you know, either love or hate, depending upon your, your tolerance for sour. Um, but it provided a context with which to sort of like entree into the rest. Um, and that just sort of snowballed into becoming a weekly column that ran for almost two years with them. 
which led on to many other bigger things, which we will talk about in just a moment. But in addition to doing the, the writing, which was, I think, you know, very important in terms of your getting some more recognition for your name and developing things like Instagram following and other social media. Um, you are also working at this time on some art stuff, if I'm not mistaken. Tell us about that. So, well, that's sort of a little bit of what's um, represented in these in these this mood board that we've got going on here. So um, you can see like sort of like the writing, you know, is, is what's happening in the upper left. Then the rest are um, the company that I ended up creating, Venom Collective, which you can see the logo for there. And then the rest is um, sort of like the start of a vision board leading up to um, a first gallery showing um, that we had with our art. That's my co-creative and photography partner, Michelle McSwain. Um, she's a childhood friend. We've known each other since we were seven and eight years old, respectively. Uh, she's just the cat's pajamas. Uh, you've had the good fortune to meet her. She's awesome. Yeah. She's polar she opposite. Just... Me. She's like calm, easy, cool. <laughs> Like total opposite, and I love her to death. And she's also a phenomenally a talented photographer. And um, I had gone to her and just said, like, hey man, um, I feel like so much of what's being done in the wine space is just so one track. And I don't know that I'm capable of, you know, creating, ideating things beyond that, but I'd love to try. And she was like, I mean, yeah, dude, if you're going to give me some wine, let's do it. And so that was how it started was just us just like sort of like playing around on the weekend. And, um, you know, I'd come up with these crazy ideas, like I'm going to throw ice cream on the ground and put some champagne with it. Or, you know, I'm going to, I don't know, I, I'm going to pour wine on my head. Like just all these different ideas that just were meant to create conversations around wine um obviously to visually be interesting because I, I i do value aesthetics um but also just to create new um new ways of talking about wine and and what when we started was just like us being silly and sort of like finding a creative outlet ended up becoming something that we've now had um multiple gallery showings um art publications wow. we have um private clients it's like a whole thing that we never would have imagined. <laughs> and again, that finds its outworking in um, another endeavor, which we'll come to in a sec. But um, if, any, if, you, if anyone does uh, not yet follow uh, Vanessa on Instagram, then a lot of um, the images are, uh, are, are, you know, are, are, are there. But they're also influenced the whole way that you present that uh, Instagram profile. You never want to just post mundane pictures. They're always pictures which are meant to be beautiful in some way and um, but also fun I think yeah I try to balance the two you know I, I try to provide my perspective I try to provide wine facts and sometimes I just try to provide a mood right like there's I to me there's a little bit of all of that in wine okay so around about this time you made um, the decision to leave MMD um, after a, how many years there it must have been five years almost, almost six it was like almost five six, years, almost six years. nine months or something yeah yeah. And so what, what prompted that decision and was it a hard decision? Oh, it was an um, torrentially hard decision. Um, you're playing the good role of interviewer. You <laughs> sat with me through a few teary eyed discussions of, you know, this sort of quandary of loving the company that I worked for so much and loving the people that I worked with so much, but also having all of these incredible things that were starting to happen for me and deciding whether or not I was going to take that jump, make that, that leap into the unknown. Um, and so, I mean, I, I, my last actual day, um, of working for MMD, I, I actually had a panic attack. I just thought I'm ruining my life. What am I doing? Um, and so, you know, there was definitely a lot of fear to be overcome, but I just, I think I sort of got to the point that I thought, up to this point, I've taken a lot of risks and they've paid off. If this one does it, then, you know, hopefully somebody will hire me again. And um, if it does pay off, then, you know, it'll have been worth it. And if not now, when? And so um, that was why I made the decision to to jump. Um, it oh, is reason, about, go on, sorry, go, ahead, that? go ahead. I was just gonna say, and the reason I just thinking, the reason that the wine was this wine for this one was that um, the, 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 um, the column that actually went like super viral i think it was the one that you actually were like oh my god your column is like getting traction was when i paired cheetos with sancerre it, like the world turned upside down for some reason that was just the one that like 
what was I thinking doing that? So that was why I chose one of my favorite Sanseres. Um, well, I don't, I don't know what Monsieur Cotta thinks about that, but anyway, his cell yeah, should I don't be know good. He, <laughs> he may or may not approve. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I think going back to the job leaving thing, I mean, um, I did the same thing of leaving behind a guaranteed salary and benefits and all that. Um, but at least at least for me, it was a, a situation where I wouldn't I couldn't live with myself unless I'd at least tried to work for myself, tried to make it work for me. Um, and I think you were sort of reaching that point as well. I was reaching the point that I thought I'm just going to kick myself if I don't at least try, um, you know, and so it's like sort of playing out like worst case scenario. All right, worst case scenario, it doesn't work out. I go broke, I have to leave the city. I gotta live on my, my dad's couch for a couple months while I get my life <laughs> Like, you know, like playing out like what is the worst possible thing that could happen? And I'm, I'm fortunate yeah. enough to have a support system of family and friends that I knew um, could be a net if I truly fell that far um, and sort of just reminding myself that, um, wasn't going to kill me so I had to at least try if it was that big of a you know a nut in the back of my head sort of banging all the time saying like well, why aren't we trying this so right. I definitely was you know deliberate and methodical in terms of setting myself up to be ready for it I didn't just you know one day walk in and say I quit I actually gave my notice in February of the year that I didn't end up leaving the company until June of that year so you know it was a long transition out and you know, certainly, I, you know, after working for good people for so long, I didn't want to leave them high and dry. And so uh, when I gave my notice, I fully expected that um, they could either tell me I needed to leave that day or that they needed me to stay for another year. And I was going to work with them on whichever they needed because they had been so good to me. Um, right. So, you know, hopefully I left the right way, but it was a terrifying experience. <laughs> well, that does. So that was the middle of uh, last year, middle of 2019. Um, and that's so we do. That does bring us to uh, 2020. Uh, clearly, a difficult uh, year for many, many people uh, everywhere, but um, an especially difficult one for you because um, you didn't just have to uh, experience COVID like uh, everyone did, but also um, you had a tragedy in your life where you lost your younger sister in um, a, an accident before COVID even started at the beginning of the year. Um, so I guess my questions are twofold. Uh, you and I were in New York City uh, at that time in the first quarter of this year. What did you do after that physically? Did you stay in the city or did you, you go and be with your family? What did you do? And second, I guess, which is more important is how did you cope? How did you stay? How did you, you know, survive yourself psychologically through that, through that time? Um, I'm not going to go so far as to say that I have survived it psychologically I think that I don't even have any comprehension yet of how much I still need to unpack uh she wasn't no. just my sister she was my truly my best friend um but I'm also fortunate to have two brothers who you see pictured below behind the uh, the bar with me there and um I was on uh, I was in Montauk actually this summer uh, i I'm now partnering on a project that uh, was meant to be in construction this summer. And because of COVID, um, you know, a halt order on everything happened and including, you know, planning board approvals, construction, all of that. And so uh, we decided to operate the space as was, even though that had never been a plan um, initially when, when we acquired the space, but, you know, in COVID, you, you got to be flexible, uh, and it also gave me something to focus my my time and my attention towards. So um, I moved both of my brothers up here, and um, we spent the summer working on a pop up um, with a Michelin chef from the city. And um, you know, I think for me, it was cathartic in the sense that I was also working on another project, which I guess we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and she was a big part of that project starting many, many years ago. And she was actually in that project and um, she knew about her place in that project. And so I just felt like something about finishing that and being able to tell her story or a piece of her story was, was um, I don't know, something that I could do that made me feel like a piece of her was still here, I guess. Right, right. 
And the other interesting thing that, at least in career terms, that's going on here is that you're adding with this restaurant project, even if it was a sort of temporary summer thing, which was very much affected by COVID, was that you're now doing another thing going on in the, in the background. So you're doing teaching and writing and art, and now you're almost back to where you started with hospitality uh, yeah. as well. So yeah. I mean, whenever I whenever I talk to you, I say, oh look, let's uh, I'll, I'll call you, and you're like, why don't you call me at midnight when I'm like, not doing something because you have so much stuff, so much stuff going on. But tell me, um, what is this wine which we have got labeled here, which literally must be the the, the wine with the longest name in the world? Um, why <laughs> why were you why were you, why were you drinking this, and, and what is it? Um, so I guess the reason I chose this wine was that um, one of the realities when you um, when you um, when you jump off a, a cliff into the the abyss is that your budget also changes when you no longer have a TME. You know, I, when I <laughs> all those years I had budgets like you know uh, with with the companies that I worked with, and so I'd gotten very used to drinking a lot of very expensive labels on a pretty regular. <laughs> But when I was back to uh, my own dime, it was uh, quite a reversal. And so trying to find um, a wine that I thought I could make my everyday house wine that um, was both affordable and made me happy and excited every time I opened it. Um, and this is probably one of my favorite, like under 25, 20 buck wines that you can find on the, on the marketplace. Um, and so I've been buying it by the caseload <laughs> and drinking well, that, it. <laughs> there you go, everyone. That, is a, that was a solid tip that you, can, uh, that you can work on and go and find it in your local retailer. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this brings us to really, I guess, what we've been hinting at this whole uh, this whole time, which is the project which has been occupying, I mean, a lot of your thoughts for, I mean, not just 2020, but way before that as well. And that's uh, this this book, which yeah. was published just a couple of weeks ago. Um, we are recording this at the end of October 2020, so in the middle of October. Um, so first of all, congratulations. Uh, tell us, please, what the, the book is called and uh, where it came from. Sure. So the book is called Big Macs in Burgundy. Um, it's a spinoff of my column, which um, we've been talking about from New York Magazine. Um, the idea behind it is taking everyday foods and pairing them with serious wines. Um, in actuality, it's everything from gas station food all the way up to three-star Michelin cuisine because, um, you know, we sort of run the hierarchy and cover everything possible from uh, you know, Trader Joe's to uh, Labernadan to scary looking foods to, you know, uh, Southern comfort food. So all different categories of food that exist in, in life and sort of pairing those with different wines and, and not only telling you like, hey, this wine is good with this food, um, but more about like, this is what this wine is, right? So learning about wines from all over the world through a, a more digestible format. Um, it also has uh, two other important components, which are very important to me that I think get overlooked a lot, which is that one, there is um, a pretty extensive um, two opening chapters that touch on um, sort of like a wine 101 and a wine and food pairing 101 um, to sort of give some context, right, which I'm so big on the context. And um, there's also a narrative component sort of telling the story of my life in wine, which we've talked a lot about today. Uh, so that might be redundant if you're going to go um, <laughs> after watching this. But um, so that that is the uh, that is the book. I was uh, fortunate enough. Abrams okay. published it for the physical imprint and um, Penguin Random House actually picked it up as an audio book, uh, which I read for. So I, it's an author read audio book for those of you who prefer to read or hear books. And by the way, I'm sorry, I keep poking audio, myself. Oh. I'm getting eaten alive. <laughs> so, so I keep trying to like whack them away from my face. I apologize for that. <laughs> Vanessa is in, is in South Carolina as we record this and I'm in, uh, I'm inside in Florida because of course it's too hot for me to be outside, but you could be outside, but you get mosquitoes. That's the trade off. Yeah, I'm just getting like, they're called no see -ums. I'd never heard of it until I came to Cal oh. South Carolina. Can't see oh. them, but they hurt. <laughs> okay, so the, um, no, the book is fabulous. You uh, asked me to um, just, you know, proofread it. And, and so I read it through twice before it was published. And you were I very, kind. Great about it. very, very kind. No, it's, it's, it's not a question about being, being kind or the fact that you're my friend. It's, it's just, it's just a great read. And I think what you, what it does so well which we can kind of hear from the conversation we've had today all the things that you, you're concerned about about you've talked about context but also about you know when you talk about WSET about 
not assuming knowledge, but also not patronizing people. Like you convey um, the basics of wine all the way up to pretty sophisticated stuff in a very effortless way, right? It never feels like you're being, uh, having stuff rammed down your throat. It's very easy to read, but suddenly you get to the end of it and you're like, oh, wow, I suddenly know a lot more about wine than I did at the beginning of it. That's the hope. <laughs> and that's why I think, um, I think that it's a great gift book as well as being a book for, for wine interested people. Thank um, you. I did all the photography. And this is, that's the other point The what is so cool, I think also about a book and, you know, having seen what you've been doing for the past five, six, seven years is that it also brings stuff like the art uh, into it as well. It's completely kind of uh, embracing of all the things that you've been working on in the past yeah. few years. Yeah. So uh, when you asked me for a, a picture representation of this time period, um, I decided to be a wise ass and I sent like 15 pictures of the same thing, which was two computers all the time, because that was my life all the time. Um, just like slaving away on this thing. You, I think if, I think it's, it, it's true what people say, if you knew what it take, took to write a book before you wrote it, you probably wouldn't write it. <laughs> but you find yourself about 70% of the way through and you're like, well, shit, man, I got to finish it now, but it's going to kill me. Um, it's uh, it's quite a beast. But um, so that was meant to be that representation. And then um, probably one of my favorite images, uh, the late great Munchies, who I also lost this year, one of my other best friends this year. It's been a shit year. Um, she and I walked outside at five o'clock in the morning. Uh, I think it was like a, a Tuesday, you know, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, um, had, a, had a glass of champagne um, when I finally delivered the final version of the manuscript before the design started. That was a whole nother level of brutality. But um, the final version of the manuscript, when I hit send on that, you know, and the sun All was right. coming for the umpteenth time. I can't tell you how many times I saw the sunset and the sunrise. <laughs> um, so that that I will always be a, a memory for me. And she was just like, can we go to bed now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what people might not appreciate. I mean, first of all, I've got the book right here. Oh, hold on. Is that, I mean, it's a beautiful book. Um, and it's got not, not just boring text like my book, but beautiful images as well, all of which you came up with and you worked with a designer and you did the illustrations. And um, that's really the difficult part. Anyone could submit, um, you know, a word document of text and have someone do the formatting and then just publish it. But the illustrations are just killer in terms of uh, integrating it with the, with the text. And I know that was a ton of work, but if you would say one thing that you learned from writing the book, um, something that was, unexpected to you about the whole experience um what kind of what kind of lesson uh some some interesting lesson has it taught you that you didn't anticipate oh i feel like i learned so many lessons mostly about contract negotiations i will negotiate a very different right. contract the next time right. the next time i need to uh to do that but i guess like in terms of like an overarching could be applied to anything um, however much work you think something like that is going to take, it's probably going to take fivefold that. And I think that, I don't think that, and, and forgive me, because I am going to speak for you a little bit here and you can tell me if you disagree, but I, I don't think that you and I are special in that we both wrote books. I think that you and I are just two people that refuse to give up, that had an idea <laughs> and saw it from the beginning to the end. And I certainly in my life have had a lot of great ideas. I have, I've had so many great ideas. Carried through on, on none of them. Started them, got them to a certain point, maybe got a permit, maybe got an LLC, maybe did a thing, but ultimately always ended up dropping it for whatever reason it was. The amount of tenacity that it took from when, because my book idea actually started back with my sister, which I was referencing before. I actually wanted to write a book, which led to me trying to get a byline, which led to me getting a column, which led to me right. writing a book that was not the book that I wanted to write, which led to, you know, it's like all of these circuitous steps, um, which took place over the course of almost seven years. Um, there were so many boulders that I had to roll up hills and I would get it over that hill and you would think, okay, that's it now. But then there would come another hill. And I, and I, 
I had no anticipation of how many hills there would be, right? I knew there would be them. I just didn't know how many. And so I think that it's, it's, you know, it's been said so many times, never give up, but like, it's literally true. If you just decide, I got laughed at so many times, including my like close friends and family. When I said I was going to write a wine book, they're like, whatever that means. Um, you just can't stop. You have to refuse to give up. If you have an idea and you think it's good, you just have to not stop. You don't get Friday nights. You don't get Sunday brunches. You don't get Tuesday afternoon naps. You just don't, you don't get them. And you got to decide that you're okay with your life being like that for whatever period of time that that is. And so I think that's the lesson that I learned because it was truly the first time that an idea I got to the finish line because <laughs> I definitely did not get to the finish line many times on many projects before that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think ideas are a dime a dozen, but the difference between success and failure is execution. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just explain to me finally, before we move on to our final slide, why uh, you're drinking 1993 vintage. Because that's my sister's vintage. Right. And 1993, in fact, is quite a good vintage in California and in Burgundy uh, and in a few other places. So hopefully you can still find some bottles from that vintage around. I try my okay, best. So <laughs> let us move uh, on because we are going to lose the light in both our places and we don't want to be talking in the dark uh, for the sake of our viewers. But I, oh. so I guess my, my, my question is really, you know, what comes next? for you, you've done the part of your career where you worked for one employer and you took your paycheck every month and then you worked for yourself. And um, in both situations, in fact, you had a whole bunch of stuff going on, side projects, which became full-time projects and other things. Are you now committed to working on one thing or are you going to keep on doing millions of different things? Well, I have one thing, which is the vast majority of the chunk of my time now, which is um, this project in Montauk. Um, it's the final chapter in the book, sort of looking at the future. And it's um, what will hopefully be a, um, you know, just like me with the high low, uh, you know, the perfect combination of a high low restaurant in terms of a luxe environment, aesthetically, um, certainly very serious food program, wine program, but in a, um, fun, gregarious, welcoming, not uh, stuffy environment. Uh, you know, we'll take you in your stilettos or your bare feet, come as you are, uh, just be ready to eat and drink really, really well. Um, that is going to be called Mavericks and um, we will hopefully be starting construction, COVID willing, <laughs> um, at the end of this year. And um, that is definitely something that is the, the, the bulk of my energy. Um, I right. can't see what the other things are, but I thought it'd be fun to uh, leave some clues or hints in the, uh, the imagery below uh, for some other things that I'm working on. Um, but certainly, you know, there's still a lot more to be done with the book in terms of, um, you know, just sort of letting people know, you know, Big Macs and Burgundy, it's, yes, of course, it's a catchy name. Um, and it's certainly a trope that you could sort of just like get stuck in, but there is more to the idea behind that. And so I hope that, that people do understand that uh, there is a beyond, beyond the irreverent title, there is something that I'm getting at there in terms of how I think that um, outside of, you know, certain parts of the industry, which certainly, you know, there's a seriousness there for very good reason, um, that we can broaden the perspective of how we view wine and how we um, matriculate life wine into our lives. Um, and so right. just having conversations around that. So hopefully this would be the first of many. Now, many wine lovers say that uh, all roads in wine lead to Burgundy. Would that be true for you? <laughs> Um, yes, that would certainly be true. So um, I blame it partly on you uh, for being uh, the, uh, the first person to take me to, to Burgundy. I'd passed through it many times in my, my trips to France, but it hadn't actually been until uh, you graciously uh, allowed me to accompany you on a trip, uh, gosh, two years ago now almost. Um, um, I've certainly always had a love for it. I'm hoping, my hope is that I can start to afford it here soon. <laughs> 
Um, but in the meantime, finding, um, you know, good uh, regional and village, um, you know, bottlings that, that that I can love and enjoy. But I guess I'm sort of holding like an ambition for myself that some of these wines that, you know, we sort of ogle over or ogle over that I can, um, you know, find a way to drink them again. Absolutely. I hear you. Well, I mean, I think that's we should uh, we should let you go now. But um, thank you very much, Vanessa. I think one of the, the takeaways that I have uh, from this whole conversation is the way that being creative in life can often open doors to you um, and open doors which can, in the end, be uh, be enough of a support for an entire career, which I think is really encouraging for a lot of people who try and be more creative but sometimes it can be difficult and I think sometimes in the wine community we can get stuck in our tram tracks that you have to be a restaurant or a retailer or an importer and there's nothing else but I think I always think there's a lot of uh, fat on the bone of the wine industry and if we can just find creative ways there are other opportunities out there and I think your career illustrates that really well so um, you know good luck for the next steps whatever they are and um, judging by your success so far I think you're going to have a very uh, very bright future so Thank you for sharing with us. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me for the last hour. It was good to talk to you, Nick. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Take care.